Hi there. What approaches to studying do you use most frequently? And how do you know they work? In this video, we'll look at the difference that often exists between psychological research that's been conducted on how to study effectively and our intuitive ideas about what works when we're studying. I'm going to put a table on the screen. On the left hand side of this table, there's a list of frequently used approaches to studying. And on the right hand side of this table, there is a very handy one word summary of what research says about the effectiveness of these approaches. If you have a look at this table, you might recognize some study approaches that you use yourself very frequently. And then if you look on the right hand side of the table, you might be alarmed to find that the study strategies you use most frequently are also the ones that have been identified by research as being of low utility. If that's the case, don't worry, you're not alone. But what's going on here? Why does it seem to be the case that the study approaches that you're most inclined to use as your go-to approaches are the ones that seem to work least effectively. The reason there can often be a discrepancy between what students think works and what research indicates actually works when it comes to studying is that we often rely too heavily on intuitive judgments about what works in our studying behavior. And the problem with this is that intuition is often flawed and leads us into adopting approaches to studying that feel more effective subjectively than they actually are objectively. Let's go with an example. Let's say you're trying to study by repeatedly rereading your source materials. With every read through of a passage of text, that passage of text is going to subjectively feel more familiar. And the danger is that you'll interpret this subjective feeling of familiarity as evidence that you can remember that material. But of course, that's not a good basis upon which to make judgments about how much of that material you can successfully retain. Quite simply, because when you're looking at material repeatedly, you've effectively got the questions and answers in front of you. And of course, things always seem a bit more simple when the answers are in front of you than when they're not in front of you. And when you have calls to recall that material for academic purposes, let's say for an exam, then obviously your source materials are probably not going to be there. So the impression of familiarity you've got during the process of studying when the source materials were available to you will not translate to situations where they're no longer available. Similarly, if you frequently use highlighting as an approach to studying, it's very easy for you to get the same illusory impression of progress that you might get from rereading content. You can look back of pages and pages of highlighted material as evidence that you've really engaged with that material. But in point of fact, your highlighting doesn't necessarily mean that you've done anything more than, well, just colored stuff in. And indeed, research on highlighting suggests that it's the students that use it the most extensively that also tend to get the least out of it. But why are we so vulnerable to approaches to studying that give this illusory impression of progress? One of the reasons that we're vulnerable to using methods of studying that give us an illusory impression of progress is that we often conflate short-term performance with longer-term learning. If you've ever crammed for an exam the night before, only to just about get through the exam but be completely unable to remember much, if anything, of what you studied a couple of months down the line, then you've just illustrated this principle. Our proclivity for short-term performance tends to mean that we're fooled into thinking that we can judge the effectiveness of a particular approach to studying by how readily it generates short-term performance gains. But that's really unhelpful because research indicates that the more effective methods of studying tend to generate poorer initial performance. For example, if you were to study using the method of retrieval practice, you'd probably find that your initial attempts to retrieve information from memory wouldn't be entirely successful. And you might interpret this initially poorer performance as evidence that retrieval practice wasn't working. Whereas in point of fact it would be working, what would be happening is you would be trading that initial performance boost for a much more stable and durable long-term learning gain. The take home message from this video for you is you need to be very wary about using approaches to studying that are giving you invariably positive indicators of your progress. 
When it comes to studying, you have to think of it as a bit like going to the gym. It's the things that challenge you, that make you sweat a bit, that tend to produce the best results. When it comes to studying, difficulty is often desirable. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please do give it a like. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to my channel for more videos on how you can use psychological research to improve the way you go about studying. If you want to know when I post new content, just turn on the bell notification symbol. Thanks very much. Thank you.